Welcome to another episode of Turn Left. I am your host, Indiana's own Dana Black, coming to you live, yes, all the way live from Black Pearl Studios, where we talk about Indiana politics from the left side of things. Okay, okay, okay. I know some of y'all are bouncing off the walls, and some of y'all not really sure what to think about all of this. But I want everyone to put everything in perspective today. This week, our country, our Democrat Party, has decided that we should, for the first time, have a woman of color in the executive branch in the White House. Now, no, there is no such thing as a perfect candidate. I tell people all the time, if you're looking for the perfect candidate, then you better put your own name on the ballot because there's nobody that you are going to 100% agree with. I know people who've been in relationships for 30 years and ask them, do they agree with everything with their spouse? And they'll tell you no, but they will go to the ends of the earth for them. So stop it with the perfection. Recognize the history that is in front of you. Progress takes time. It may not be what we want all at once, all the time, but yo, The way this election is about to happen, the way this blue wave is coming, we have the opportunity to stop the nonsense that is actually happening in the White House, which also includes halting all those federal judges that are being appointed, praying every day that the the notorious one can stay with us long enough to get through this daggone thing so that we don't mess up the Supreme Court more than it already is. And making sure that we don't have people like Betsy DeVos trying to defund public education. And so that we have people who want to run the post office instead of shut it down. There are so, so many things at stake with this election. So many things. And I wish the perfect candidate, I'm going to tell you something. I told y'all way back in February, unless Stacey Abrams was on the ballot, That was my perfect choice. That was the one for me. That was my number one pick. So guess what? I did not get my number one pick and she wasn't even a number two pick. Mm -hmm. But guess Mm -hmm. what? I'm voting blue because I know no matter what, those two people, when it comes to writing policies that are going to impact the lives of Americans, they're going to be on the correct side of things the majority of the time. Not 100% with me and what I want. But they are definitely going to be, I imagine, between somewhere between 75 and 90% on the, way, on the way I see things. And I think that's what we need to look at. I think we get caught up sometimes in, in a lot of minutia. But if we really take step back a little bit and look at what we have in front of us, I am not going to try to shame anybody into who they should vote for. You vote for who you want to vote for. But I'm going to ask the question that 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 Republican, they they love to bring out every now and then. They will bring him out just to show you how Republican they are. Are you better off now than you were four years ago? If If you're better off and you like where you are, then you continue to vote for this regime. You continue to vote for this person who doesn't understand history or the constitution or laws for that matter. You continue to do that. But for the rest of us who are out here struggling, trying to stay alive, literally, not even, I'm not even, you know, being like way out there. We are literally trying to stay alive in the middle of a pandemic because there's nothing normal about 166,000 people dying in a seven month span in our nation. There's nothing normal. That is not the flu. Stop it. That is not the flu. The flu does not kill 166,000 people in seven months. Seven months. Mm -hmm. Let's put all of this in perspective. Can we please? So I think my closed captioning got turned off. Oh, where'd it go? Can you guys still hear me? Well, I'm sorry. Hopefully it'll come back on. I don't know what happened. I might have yelled too loud for it. (laughs) I don't know. Because I'm hyped. I'm hyped. This is an exciting time. As a woman of color who gives a lot of herself freely to making sure that Hoosiers have an opportunity to pursue whatever dreams that they have by making sure that there are people in place who are writing policies that impact our lives positively, I am excited. 
I'm excited. When I think about Jennifer Crossley's little daughter, Kendall, and how bossy boss she is at five years old, I know she's a natural born leader. I think for her, by the time she's in her teens, this is nothing unusual. This is, this is, this is, it's, everything is normal to see women leading, to see women of color leading. I, again, you know, me and Kamala, we ain't a hundred percent, but I don't give a daggone. She's closer than Mike Pence will ever be. <laughs> True. That's all I'm going to say about that. Um, I know a lot of schools are going back in session and I'm going to say this again. Uh, I'm going to say it every week because, uh, again, 166,000 people dead in seven months is not normal. Um, we're sending kids back to school without making sure they have what they need. We're sending teachers and administrators and, and, and engineering staff and bus drivers and all these adults who do catch the virus and do have negative outcomes. And oh, by the way, we still haven't completely analyzed the long-term effects because we don't know what they are. But we also, we know there's going to be respiratory issues and brain fog, excuse me, brain fog. And if you ever are intubated, you know, that's no fun. So I'm sending positive energy out to all the students and all the adults that are in charge of managing the, the curriculum and molding the minds of these students. Please be safe. Please social distance. Wear your mask. Let's stay safe. I don't want to see another 166,000 people dead in the next seven months. So enjoy your year. Be safe. But I'm sending positive energy out to you because it's scary times. All right. So I'm can spend all day talking about how excited I am that I see a woman of color on our, our ticket. But I want to hear from our guests real quick so we can get their take on it. They've both been in this business for a lot longer than me. They've been doing this thing as Democrats a whole lot longer than me. You feel me? So let me introduce to you, if I may. I like, I, like, I just like, you know, doing like dramatic pauses because I think I'm an entertainer. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm excited. All right. From the West side, which her predecessor used to always say the best side, but I, I, I would debate that of Indianapolis running for how, uh Oh, house district 95, 92, 92. Ooh, 92 house district 92. Y'all give it up for my girl, my friend, someone that I have been excited about once I saw that she declared that she was running for office. Y'all give it up for Renee. Turner Pack. Renee, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you, Dana. Thanks for having me. I'm my, excited too. My pleasure. And all the way from up north, hitting the border, baby. Someone that I've been kicking it with now ever since I've been out, since the Federation, since we, you know, we've known each other for a long time. You know, when you talk about that sister girl power and, and people pushing you and motivating you and just doing the little things to give you a leg up and put you on behind the scenes that nobody knows about. That's who my next guest is. Y'all give it up for my girl running in house district number four, Deb Porter, way from up north. I mean, I'm going to tell you something. Deb Porter so bad, they got a whole county named after her. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to the show. Ladies, I'm going to let y'all just dive into this. Talk about what it means to see Senator Kamala Harris on our ticket as vice president of the United States of America. Um, you want me to go first? Absolutely. Go okay. Um, well, I waited all afternoon, what was it, Tuesday, to get the news. And really at that point, as long as I saw that it was a woman of color, I was just going to be thrilled. And then when I saw that it was Kamala Harris, I was just even more thrilled. This is exciting. This is innovative politics. And it's somebody's finally... We have a president or uh, candidate that's willing to take that chance. So I'm excited. I keep going out. Oh, oh you're oh. fine. You're fine. You're fine. Are you okay? Yeah. Um, so I'm excited. I think that her and Joe are going to work very well together. Mm -hmm. I saw a little bit of that today. Um, I believe we need to get with that ticket, support that ticket. But as you said, everybody needs to vote. Uh, the way they want to. But I will say this, this is a time to 
rely on some grace for our candidates because what's most important is that in November, we have a new president and vice president. That's looking at the biggest possible picture. So I'm excited. I look forward to seeing how the rest of the campaign goes, the convention next week and all of that. So I'm ready. Let's roll. And Deb, give us your take on it. So when I saw the short list of candidates, I knew that the country was going to be just fine. Um, you know, he had some really great women on that list. And I honestly was comfortable with any of them. But when it was Kamala, I was real excited. I liked her. I, you know, when she was running for president, I thought she had really strong. She had she just really brought a lot to the table. I liked a lot of what she stood for. Um, when she, when she, um, bowed out, you know, I was like, well, okay, mm -hmm. you know, um, I, I get it. Mm -hmm. Um, when he, when he chose her, I was, you know, honestly, I was a little bit surprised, but not really. And here's why she, she was, she really went after him at the debate mm -hmm. and, you know, and, and to some people, and, and this might be a cultural thing that was very off putting. And I know there are a lot of people that I talk to who are like, well, I don't know, you know, she really went after him and I don't know, you know, if they're going to really be able to, you know, work together. It, it speaks very well of him that he understands that that was a debate and that's what you do at a debate to win a debate. And he chose her. And um, I, I think it's going to be a fantastic, um, it, it's a great ticket. Absolutely. Can I say something else? Absolutely. I'm, I'm just so angry that that the um, that literally within minutes of the choice being announced, the name calling. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That mm -hmm. what is? Uh, I mean, come on. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. As an elementary teacher, we do not allow <laughs> name calling, and I'm just appalled that you know here we are, the leader of the. Um, it's not the free world anymore. It's no, not. it costs a lot of money. <laughs> used to, you know, the president of the United States used to be the leader of the free world. It yeah. is not anymore. No. But, you know, resorts immediately to vile name calling. Absolutely. It's, but see, I, I'm, I'm going to say something to all the people that have been out here calling names and questioning and, and slighting and all of that. Sorry to inform you, but as black women, we tend to expect it. Not that we want it. Not that it's unusual. We expect it. I anticipated it. Trust no one believes Senator Harris knew the hate was coming. Because when you are a person of color, a bl and especially a woman, women, women, we already know as women. You, what you wear and what your hair looks like and criticizing everything about your woman. You're not, you're not trying to take me home and make me your wife. You're trying to send somebody to the White House. So how she wear her hair or, or what she looks like, what, what does that got to do with anything? And then as a black woman, you know, hey, we're not allowed to be ambitious. We can't be ambitious. And, you know, we show us how heck can't be one of them uppity... I stopped myself. Y'all thought I was going to say it. Didn't you, you? You, know, you know how scary it's out. We can't be yep. too uppity. But you know, I bought merchandise to say uppity on it because <laughs> I'm a change maker. And I'm not I'm not looking for, and, and, and I, I can guarantee you, Kamala Harris, Senator Kamala Harris is not looking for validation of her womanhood, of her heritage. She's not looking for validation. She is saying, I want to serve you and I'm trying to earn your vote. If you don't, If you don't like her policies, I get with you. But don't tell me she's ambitious or she uppity when she's not doing anything that any other person who wants to make something of themselves is doing. Because if she wasn't, she'd be a welfare queen. You can't win for losing. So that's why I don't even worry about them people that, that was off-putting. It's off-putting to think that, you know, it's a race bait proposition to select a black person or a, a person of color, or, or it's, a, it's, a, it's a, a, a gender bait when we select a woman, when it, all, every person in the executive branch, with the exception of one, has been a white male. You yep. cannot narrow the focus down more than that. So don't tell me about, you, you know, well, you know, we shouldn't judge um, based on race and gender. I'm sorry. The 
that's all we've ever had. That's all. How you go? You know how you going to dismiss that? The fact that everyone but one has been a white male. So the fact that we want to see ourselves in leadership. You you want to challenge you know qualifications at this point? You mean to tell me Dan Quayle was the best qualified person <laughs> to be VP? You mean to tell me that? You better come again, come again. So I wanted to echo that because I'm with you on that. But she, yeah. but trust me, she doing like it. She ain't. Oh, I you know she's gonna she's got brought you know she's got the shoulders to handle it and the chutz spot to just give it right back and she should. But it 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 is not. It is, it's not healthy for our children to see this kind of behavior. No. It is not healthy for our society to normalize this kind of behavior. No, it's not. And I think that's my point. And I, and I get that. And I, and, and we're right. You're right. We should not normalize it. Um, uh, but you know, Hey, they liked him because he, because he, he tells is. it, he yeah. tells it like it is. It don't matter what he's yeah. telling you is a lie, but he tells it like it is. Yeah, whatever. Yeah. All right. So yeah. let's get into these candidates. Cause these are amazing women. Renee, tell the people who you are and where you come from. All right. My name's Renee Turner Pack. I'm from the beautiful west side of Indianapolis by way of Nashville, Tennessee. Oh. Um, I served in the United States Army from 1986 to 1994. Ooh. So I'm a very, very proud veteran. I specialized in behavioral science during that time, helped a lot of Gulf War veterans as they came back with psychiatric injuries, uh, PTSD, um, just a very trying time, but it was so worthwhile. I wouldn't change anything. I have four grown children. Um, the last of which the youngest just got her diploma yesterday yay. from Ball State. Oh, so, yay! Yeah, so I always tell them, go ahead and grab your education. That's one thing, Kay, nobody ever take away from you. Go ahead and get that and put it in your back pocket and keep it moving and serve other people. I'm married to the finest man I've ever met, Sean Pack, and I'm an educator by trade. Um, I serve in the Wayne Township School District. So uh, I'm just really grateful for this road to this candidacy. Um, I think that I've been where a lot of our folks have have been before. Mm -hmm. And I always share the story after we got out of the uh, after I got out of the military. I hadn't met this husband yet. (laughs) (laughs) I'm going to pass that by. We just go skip over that. All right. I got out and it was very, very difficult. You don't just come out of the military into this easy, simple life. And that's what I thought the transition would be a lot easier. So, you know, I know about housing insecurity, food insecurity. I lived it with my children. I know how desperate young mothers, um, grandparents that are raising children, I know how desperate they are, Um, not just now, but have always been on some scale. So, that's all I'm going to say right now, and maybe we can get into some more a little bit later. Oh, you like you like to get the juicy convo going. All right, Miss Dan <laughs> Porter, tell the people who you are and where you come from. So I'm um, actually a born and born and bred Hoosier. Um, I uh, went to a small town, a rural. I grew up in a small town just um, seven miles west of Valparaiso, and. Um, um, went all the way to the, all the way to the big city of Valparaiso for my uh, bachelor's degree. That's where I met my husband. Um, it, uh, we got married and uh, moved away for a few years. Um, we have uh, two children. They're all grown up now and we've got two grandchildren. Uh, both of my children um, moved away. Um, they don't live in Indiana. We're part of the brain drain. Um uh, our daughter lives in Vermont. She's an athletic trainer. Uh, she teaches athletic training at um, a Castleton University. And um, our grandsons are in third grade and kindergarten. Wow. And uh, then our son is living in New York City. And he's a, li- he, he's a light designer. He's an independently employed light designer. He works on um, shows. Uh, so he was the as- as- associate light designer for The Waitress that Broadway oh. show. And uh, he's done, he's currently very unemployed. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, he's working on his MBA, trying to, you know, make some, you know, use of this downtime and, I got one uh, yep. you know, keep working. So anyway, um, husband and I've been married for a long time. 
and uh, I'm a teacher. I teach. Um, I teach element. I'm actually a music teacher. I teach elementary music right now. I'm also certified in elementary, and I've done both jobs. But music is my first love. And um, I uh, actually went through a job transition. My husband is an ordained pastor in the Lutheran Church, mm-hmm. and uh, we moved. That's where we lived away for so long. And he decided not to be a parish min- minister anymore, but to go into hospital chaplaincy, which meant oh. go back to school. When you um, give up your church and you live in the parsonage, you're suddenly homeless. Yeah. <laughs> and so we moved in with mom and two children and a dog and an unemployed husband for two years. And that was, you know, interesting. Hard. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, we learned again uh, that we were homeless and that we were poor and uh, we were on the free reduced lunch and we were asked if we needed a Christmas basket and, you know, things like that. And we were like, no, we're good. We're good. But, you know, we were on WIC. And so those were, you know, very eye opening times for me um, because I'd never gone through that before. Mm -hmm. And it really kind of it was very um, significant in shaping uh, understanding a part that I had really never really thought about. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you know, as I volunteer for the food pantry, I, it's re- in, reiterated. I mean, it just, it really was very shaping for me to to have lived Gone those two that. years. You know, and it's, but, I find it interesting that both of you um, talk about what it was like to have to struggle for a little while. Um, Renee, you coming out of the military with babies, uh, Deb with you and your you and your husband transitioning and, and, and having to, to squeeze it tight. You know, we're living in a time where, uh, you know, people who are getting about three grand a week are, you know, as our legislators are telling Americans that um, the little extra six hundred dollars that we could give them during the middle of a pandemic they ain't trying to fix um, Mm -hmm. is too much. Mm -hmm. I know as parents and my mother was, you know, she would give you her last. And, And I know that she would she at times sacrificed for us. I know that there are times when you guys were hungry, but what was it like as a parent having to, you know, go, oh my goodness, do I have enough food for my kids? Well, you know what? You're, you're always on. You're always, you're thinking about, okay, what are we going to do for tonight? I've made, uh, I, I used to make a dish. I told the kids it was called Bichy Squaw. <laughs> they said Bichy Squaw. And I'd had some cornmeal and little balls, and I'd fry them with ketchup. And they, I said, this is Bichy Schwa, this is French. And they would get so excited <laughs> about it. But you're always on, you're always wondering, you're always trying to figure out how's the electric bill going to get paid, how's the rent going to get paid until you're evicted. And then when you're evicted, it's day to day. Where am I going to wash up? What hotel am I going to live in? And this is my story. So right. um, I know how it can get, but... As a parent, it's just times of total desperation being looked down upon. And in my current job, the job I've been doing in the district for the past eight years is uh, a position called parent and community liaison. And that's why it was so rewarding to me because I understood that parent desperation when it comes to those tough, tough times Mm -hmm. and, you know, trying to make those moms and dads understand it's hard now, but we're going to do what we can. That's why us as legislators and as leaders, we've got to give them some support. we yeah. got to give them something to hold on to yeah. so that they can make it to where we made it, Deb. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. Who would have thought that, you know, I'd be running for a state rep after time. I'm talking about some years like that. But I went back. I finished my bachelor's. I went back again, finished my master's. Just excelled at work, but we need to hear that from mm-hmm. leaders, and we need to hear that from people who have been through the same thing. And we need to lead, mm-hmm. help lead them out of this space of poverty. There's, I mean, not much else I can call it. Yeah, it's poverty. Deb, what is it, what was it like for you? So, and I'm embarrassed. Um, I I was living with mom yeah. and. You we didn't. Have, we we weren't we weren't like that. Mm-hmm. We were not housing insecure. We weren't food insecure. I mean, we had plenty of nights of potato soup. I mean, you know, but we weren't hungry. Um, and 
and and so by and large uh, we were we were not by any stretch you know um you know that there's somebody could always be worse off and and you're yes. putting things in perspective exactly. right now that's Exactly. But the yeah, struggle is, to, you know, your struggle was your struggle, right? right. And, and so right. let's not, right. let's not, right. you know, uh, and, begrudge it. And, yeah. And I, and, and I honestly, I honestly would never say that mine was so severe. Mm -hmm. um, it, it was, it was eye opening for me. I, I remember when the trustee's office called um, in October and we were going through the, the great chicken pox epidemic um, in our family Lord. at that time. Uh, yeah, because, you know, they all get it at the same time. One started after the other, right? <laughs> so um, and, and they said, well, you know, we're getting our we're getting the um, trustee's office. We're getting we know you're on free and reduced lunch. Um, how many people will you need to be, be feeding at Thanksgiving? And I'm like, well, you know, we're, we're the, and I really didn't understand what they were asking. And then they said, well, you know, we will deliver the, the, the Thanksgiving dinner for your family. And I'm like, why? I mean, I was that clueless. Yeah, um, yeah. And finally, finally, it dawned on me and said, oh, no, we don't need that. We really don't need it. I'm living with my mom. The family's here. We, we're not. No, give it. We're fine. Give it to somebody who needs it. And they're like, well, what about Christmas presents? I said, really, we're fine. We'll, we'll be OK. Mm. Please pass it to spread the spread it to other people we're we're good and you know and i hung up and i was like i was just shaking i'm like you know i i really did i i it it, it was very um it, it was just you know really oh wow uh, <laughs> yeah it was yeah it was a discovery for you yeah. right it was a discovery because you were like you know the, the people would actually need that but here's the thing you know, you weren't a greedy person, you know, and that's one of the things that's been driving me crazy about the conversation from the other side, which is, you know, an extra $600 is going to make people lazy and they're never going to want to go back to work again. Well, you know, <laughs> let me tell you about, so I've been up until school just started. So, um, from the stay at home orders, um, I, I'm on the board for, um, an organization that has, among other things, a food pantry. Mm -hmm. So I was going it once a week to help with the food pantry. And we'd get people, and our clientele's been just going up and up and up, obviously. And this, what we've been telling people, you know, they'd come and they're like, I've never been here before. I don't even know what to do. They're like, okay, welcome. We're glad you found us. Now here's what we're going to do. And they're like, well, I won't, I won't have to be here next week. I should get my unemployment check. And I said, no, tell you what, we're here every week. You come next week too, because getting the food here means you won't have to buy that money. stuff at the grocery store and you'll stretch that unemployment money more. Mm -hmm. So come, keep coming here as long as you need to, so that you can stretch that, that unemployment money. And let's face it, if you haven't gotten it yet, you're not going to get it next week. Right. <laughs> Hate to do this, sweetie, but you've been waiting 12 weeks for it. It's probably not going to come yet. But I mean, you know, just giving them the, and, you know, we run on donations and our community has been amazing and donations have been just flowing in mm -hmm. both in physical donations and monetary donations. And we're ever so grateful to our community for remembering the food pantry. But, um, you know, just telling people that, you know, that use the food pantry, you're unemployed, use the food pantry, let that use that unemployment money or whatever little money that you're still getting to stretch that money further on Absolutely. your other things. But, you, but know you know, these are people who've been in really good jobs, suddenly find themselves unemployed yeah. through yeah. no fault of their own. Yeah. It's a pandemic. They didn't do anything to lose their job. No. And, well, but you know, see, the argument, and see, we, and you know, it, it drives me crazy, is like, you know, they're making, they're, they're, it, it almost seems like they're trying to make it seem like it's an either or opposition, a proposition. Either mm -hmm. you stay at home to protect your health and limit movement and just have the necessities, or you go back to work so you can make some money so you can feed yourself, but risk dying. And it's like, yeah. that's, I don't, I don't understand why it's a zero sum game here. I don't understand why the government that is supposed to be looking out for us and the people that we put in place to look out for us is making us choose between, you know, literally life and death 
and death and life. I mean, right. it literally is like that because, you know, you can, you can, you, you can take me out with a thousand cuts or you can hit me with one swift, you know? And so, and this, this is the part that I'm having the, the, the biggest issue with, especially when Senator Bray, you guys are both educators. You guys are, you know, in the schools. You just got through talking about how chicken pox ran rampant through the house. We already know schools are Petri dishes. And then this guy yeah. sends this mafia style letter about, well, you know, you're not going to get all your money if you don't open up. I don't understand that. Why would you do that to people? Why would you give them those kind of stressors about, well, we, I have high risk kids or I have kids who have high risk family members and you're telling them that you're not going to allow them to offer an alternative. That's the, those are the things that I know as Democrats, we think about, but y'all, when y'all get <laughs> into that state house, I'm going to need y'all to pull his coattail on some things. <laughs> <laughs> You know, I think that just proves the dis the total disconnect. How are you going to take 15% of educational funding when we're scrapping by on 100? Huh. You see what I'm saying? Where, where do you come from? Are you in Indiana? Are you uh, in Europe or, or somewhere Martha. else? You can't take 50. That lets me know where your heart is. Oh. And that lets me know what you really care about. Mm. And it's not our children here in Indiana. Mm. That's not what you care about. If you give parents and educators that kind of an ultimatum, I think you you just um, are totally disconnected to what's affecting kids in education. I just thought that was so brutal. Oh. And, um, I, it, and that's all I can call it. It's just brutal. You're going to take money out of our already limited budget because you want butts in seats and parents have decided that they want some of them want their kids to study at home it, it was unbelievable so as far as i know governor holcomb wrote back that he had no plans to do that and i hope that's how it stands i just yeah and and then the other part about that is now you want to cut funding because some school systems want to do a hybrid school and online but you didn't defund those online schools that robbed us of six million dollars. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Yep, that's right. <laughs> that's right. It's all backwards. It's yeah. all backwards. Well, and honestly, if he really believed that, why didn't he, this come up last March when everybody in the state had to stay home for the rest of the year? Why wasn't he sending the letter then? Oh, I guess we're all a we're a hundred percent virtual school, you know, state now. So we're going to reduce the funding. Why wasn't that done back then? Why is it now? It's purely political posturing on his part. It's purely bullying behavior. Well, and you know what, Deb? I thought it was because uh, our major, our largest school district, IPS, has chosen to go virtual. Mm. My, district, my district is virtual for the first time. Yeah. And when you have a school district that big of black and brown children, mm. you get upset when you've got an African-American superintendent making these big, big decisions. Mm. Pike yep. Township, another woman superintendent, she said, we're not quite ready yet. We're, let's look at this thing again in September or October. You know, and, and I hate to keep going back to misogyny, but that just make, is what it makes me, me think of. And these are women in power that the governor is told to make these decisions. They made the decision and now you want to punish them. Mm. Yeah. And let's remember the governor had the right to make the decision and handed it off. Chicken. Right. Right. Chicken. right. Everything got handed off. Well, every yeah. time he made a decision, Mike Pence came to town and told him not to do it <laughs> or to, you know, made him change his mind or whatever it was. Right. So, I mean, I, I tell people all the time, Mike Pence is a bad boy. He got two <laughs> jobs. He the vice president of the United States and he's the governor of the state of Indiana at the same time. That's why we need to elect Dr. Woody Myers so that we know that he will be the only governor with Linda Lawson by his side. Te look, do you see a similarity there? Joe Biden, yep. Kamala, Dr. Woody Myers, Linda right. Lawson. I'm just saying. And in Indiana? And come on. <laughs> but, but I mean, but that's what we need. I tell people all the time, we have a lot of elected officials we don't have a lot of elected leaders and I'm loving yeah. the conversation between the two. That was a, Renee, you just made me think about some things. I hadn't yeah, even thought of it I, like it that. Me when I looked at the districts that were choosing to go virtual, they never said they were going to go virtual the whole year. They mm -hmm. just want to be ready and to make sure everything's in place so that they can be as safe as possible. And as soon as you got word of that, uh, pro temp, 
you said, well, I'm going to tell you what, I'm going to cut 15% and I'll teach you to yeah. go against what we want. And, yeah. and I just thought it was totally unfair and hurtful to, to children, families, educators, everybody. Absolutely. So, you know, yeah. go ahead, Deb. I'm sorry. Go ahead. And our district decided at the end of June, 1st of July, that we were going to go virtual for nine weeks. And the big def- and, and we're, we have a female um, superintendent as well. Um, and uh, the, the big thing was we calculated how many packages of Clorox wipes we would need in one day just in our high school that has uh, 4,000 people, you know, 4,000 kids in it. That's a big and, school. Yeah. And when we started doing the math that, you know, there's 150 wipes in a package of Clorox, you know, a canister, and there's um, six periods and we have to wipe the 30 desks off after each class. And, you know, doing that times how many classrooms and you still can't get Clorox wipes. Mm. Right. So you guys um, use math to determine yeah, yeah, whether or not, kids, you know, we're a you know, data, data driven district sometimes. Uh, I, I wonder what the, you know, the education decision board would look like if they actually had educators on it. Yes. Mm-hmm. Who, weren't, who weren't privatizers? I'm just saying. Every once in a while you'll get a, a former educator on the board. We're, we ha- we do out here. Um, I was talking yeah. about the ones that the governor appointed. Oh, way up there. Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. There's no, there's no, there's not one educator on his governor appointed education right. board. But right. so I, I'm right. confused. I mean, listen, I know that kids need an education, but I don't know how to do it. Mm-mm. Let uh, the people who know what they're doing do it. That's right. Absolutely. I want to switch gears real quick because, um, one of the things that we we do not spend enough time talking about, and I, I, I'm just as bad as everybody else is about it, I want to make sure that we talk about um, our veteran care. And you brought up something incredibly important, and that was the veteran care, the transition, what it is, what it is, what it means to come home, and the mental health care that they need. Talk about where Indiana ranks and what we are doing for all these people that we say we love. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. We, um, I think in Indiana, I know my representative works very hard on behalf of veterans. Shout Carly out to Mason. Carly Mason. Right. Mm-hmm. She's out there and, and she's since the beginning been proposing legislation to benefit veterans, but there's still more work to do. I had a veteran call me a few weeks ago about a, a benefit for disabled adult children after both parents die that are veterans. They can't get that money right now. And so we need something that's saying as long as they are at home, they should be able to draw on their parents' um, veteran benefits. So there's a lot of things. I'm looking right now, you know, to bring it up to date, the situation with the post office. I mean, that used to be like a train. You got out of the Army or military, and you went to the post office. And they really favored and gave veterans a break um, as far as employment. So now we've got, I think the number was 97,000 veterans working for the USPS. And now with all this uncertainty with whether we're going to be able to continue the USPS with the funds that they need, I mean, it's going to be very difficult. And here we go again. We might have a lot of veterans out of work. The ones who, through all this COVID, have delivered our mail, sorted our mail, and worked hard. And now they have to worry about this. Tell me again the number of veterans that are working at the United States Postal Service. 97,000 is what I researched the other day. That's a lot. And that's probably less than it used to be because that was almost a rite of passage. Yes. And we, you know, and if you get on the post office, you had a good job. Yes. Yeah, good, good job. So you know? let, let me get this straight, Deb. I, and you can chime in on this too. 97,000 veterans are working for the United States Postal Service. The Republican Party at this particular moment in time is doing everything they can to shut it down. How is it that they actually care about veterans? They don't. They do not. Um, Not from what I see from most of them. They do not. And it was a lot, I'm telling you firsthand, to make that promise to God and to your country that you would die on behalf of this country and to come out and be faced with a leader like this who does not care about 
veterans. So it's very disheartening. Um, I'm just very, I'm just angry yeah. right now. Oh, the, and we should be the angry. Level of, yeah, the level of disrespect is just unbelievable. And then the support that he, he gets, him and his folks get. His minions. I Damn. call them minions. I'm not going to call no. them deplorables. <laughs> I just call yeah. them minions. And the other yeah. thing is, think of the, the thing that I think that, that is probably, because I get angry about it as well, The we were running post-mail before we were a country. Yeah, that's yep. right. Yep. You, and they're letting this orange buffoon shut down something that has existed longer mm -hmm. than our country. Then Mm -hmm. But it all goes back to what's the main reason? What are we really looking at? We're looking at election 2020, where he's trying to suppress the vote in any kind of way that he possibly can. And without being able to mail in votes or slow down the voting uh, process as far as mail in votes go, whatever, whatever he can do, he's going to pull it out of his hat in the next three months. You can believe that. Oof. Well, it's you know, goes back to the beginning of time, voter suppression. Here mm. we go again. Here we go. And I mean, but the, why aren't these Republicans screaming up and down? They they know that they actually have a good turnout when there's when there's mail in voting. Republicans turn out for mail in voting. I think it's the coronavirus. What about you, Deb? I don't know. I think they know that with the coronavirus, a lot of people will choose to mail in their vote, and so that's why. Yeah, I think I think they're just well, and up here we've got a lot of. Uh, I live in a town that is heavily Republican, and um, our um, test positive positivity rate is over seven and a half percent, and we're still doing school full on, um, and uh, masks are optional. I mean, people are not following the mask rules. Um, I mean, you would think that, you know we lived under some magic words or something up here. Um, I mean, we, we pretty much stay home. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I mean, talk about campaigning. I mean, we're just doing lit drops. We've got a little, we've got a little note in it. This is for your safety. We're just doing a lit drop. The candidate information is on the card. Feel free to contact me if you have wanted to discuss any issues. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, I, I don't feel comfortable knocking on people's doors and right. engaging in conversation. I don't think it's, safe thing to be doing mm -hmm. um so yeah i i think that um to some extent i think the republicans have bought have drunk the kool-aid that um this is all a hoax mm -hmm. you know i there's a lot of them that really think that i've talked to a few people that say well you know this coronavirus is going to be all over at, right after the election it's That's like the democrats have made this up <laughs> 166,000 people dead in seven yeah. months. And, you, yeah. and we, we made it up. Yeah. That's devastating. And and personally, my sister-in-law is recovering right now from COVID. Mm. My next door neighbor was sick for months at the beginning of this thing. So believe me, folks, it's not a hoax. This is real. Oh, yeah. Folks are very yeah. sick and folks are dying. I lost another friend back in March. We had one of our precinct committee people that passed away in March or April. This is so real and it's so close. And it just, to just denying it and saying that it's not real is so irresponsible. Yeah. And they were fine with it as long as it was happening just in urban hubs. And, and yeah. you know, and, and I think the thing that probably annoys me, and, and, and I know I normally don't talk about what's going on at the Fed level, but here's an opportunity, like, there are other states that are collaborating to do things differently, you know, because the Feds are all jacked up, but our state leadership is not doing anything. They're not doing anything. And so, unfortunately, because they're not doing anything for me to criticize them for, I got to criticize <laughs> the federal government. Because yeah. I, you, I don't, I am, I am certain and I am clear that they do not care if we live or die. And, and I know that sounds hyperbolic. Is that the right word, teachers? Okay. Hyperbole. Hyper, okay. Yeah. <laughs> I, I think that there's, I think the other thing is, if you look at the people, and, and so there is, there is, we know that the we know the vulnerable populations, mm -hmm. okay, and I think that there are factions in the Republican Party 
in the leadership of the Republican Party who have decided, okay. They're expendable. They're expendable. Mm -hmm. And then for seniors in nursing homes, where was the cry out for that? That was just an abomination. Why they, how many millions of dollars are not going to be distributed in um, Medicaid? And it's a um, census year? Their, what are their benefits after they, Social Security. Right. Which They're not going to be distributing those funds, so those get mm. to go back in the kitty. Mm. African Americans, brown people, yeah, people with health problems that are, you know, already kind of using the system just to get health care. Those are the ones that were dying. And the mean, essential the workers world. that we pay 15 cents to. The yeah. How are you going to call them essential and not give them no money? I just. Yeah. Yeah. Right. These are essential. Then, but you know what? The essentials, they were out there every day. A lot of them got sick trying to keep working and keep supporting their families. And, and we didn't do what we should for them. No, well, well, the same thing with the veterans, though. Because those same essential workers didn't have any covered sick leave, didn't have, I mean, if they're sick and have to take off for two weeks, they're going to lose their job. Mm -hmm. You know, they don't have any health care benefits with their job because even though they're essential workers, they're probably only working 23 hours a week. God forbid that we should give you health care of any kind. Mm -hmm. And, you know, if you work 30 hours, we'd have to do that. So we're going to keep you at 23 hours just to make sure. Mm -hmm. Um and then you, then those same people are working two jobs because you can't make a living on 23 hours a week. And so they're compromised just from exhaustion alone. Absolutely. Um, yes. I mean, you know, it, it's just, it. so with, with this, with this plague, all of our weakest societal, um, sins have mm -hmm. been brought right, right out in the open. We're, we've not taken care of our people. We've not made health care a priority. Um, mental health is ignored in our country. And so what do we see? We've got people with depression, mm -hmm. um, who've never had depression and know where, where to turn for help. Mm -hmm. People with depression who sunk into a spiral of worse depression. And now we've got rising suicide rates. Mm. Um, we've got, you know, the isolation and the sense of loneliness that is causing people to have, you know, developed agoraphobia, fear of going out of their house now, mm. and you know, all these other mental issues that are coming up. And again, our state ignores mental health. We closed our mental health hospitals. We do, we just deny that it even exists. And when, when we're talking to people and one of the things that keeps coming up is, and I hate when they come up to when we're talking at an event or something and they'll say, I just hope that you can do something. I have a relative with mental health and I just want to cringe because it's like, Oh honey, you need to move to another state. Right. And uh, <laughs> it's, state yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, just, it's no different than, <laughs> you know, knowing that if you have asthma, you probably shouldn't live here. Yeah. Cause absolutely. the air quality is so crap. You shouldn't live. I mean, um, obviously being, you know, upperly mobile is something, if you're an essential worker, you probably can't be. So you kind of stuck where you are, like the folks, some folks down in Martinsville, where this Senator Bray is from, you know, Martinsville is a cancer pocket. They don't actually have a healthcare facility. They have a cancer center. So wait a minute, if you don't have enough clientele for a hospital, but you got enough clientele for a specialized cancer center. Mm, mm, mm. That's Come because, you're, yeah. You know what I'm saying? Think about it. The hospital handles a whole bunch of stuff so we gonna take everything we gonna take your high blood pressure your maternity we gonna take your broken limbs we gonna we gonna take everything but if you're mm -hmm. a, a specialized cancer you we're, yeah. we're only employing hematologists mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, or, so not hematologists oncologists my bad I, I have a hematologist now so yeah <laughs> blood clot. They can have hematology there too. Yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, yeah. But I'm just saying, for the most part, we're, we're looking at oncologists and treating cancer. And that's mm -hmm. a very specialized thing versus a, a general hospital that can, can't handle everything. And, mm -hmm. and when you have, you know, places like Martinsville, where Senator Bray is from, I mean, his own community is a cancer pocket and he's not doing what he can to expand health care. He's not doing what he can to um, make it so that people are as safe as they possibly can be during a, a, a pandemic. Those are, I mean, that's just, I can't get with it. I don't understand. 
Well, is he even doing what he could be doing just to make that area cleaner and safer? You, you mean like environmental changes and things of that nature? <laughs> yeah. No. I mean, yeah. I mean, that's what I mean. No. You know. Is it, listen, and, is anybody in that supermajority doing anything for our environment? No. Yeah. East Chicago still has lead in their water. Yeah. And that's where, you know, we everything is politicized. It's like if you have this belief that we need clean water, that we need clean air, then you must be a liberal Democrat. That's not a liberal Democratic issue. That's an everybody issue. That's a human issue. It's a human rights issue. It's human. We all like yeah. to live. We all like to breathe. But it, and it just like the mask, it comes down to almost a party question it makes you wonder Democrat, you wear a mask if you're not then you don't wear a mask or you're more prone to not wear a mask we're talking about life and death here we're not talking about political parties and that's what that environmental issue made me think of this is our whole this is everybody's issue it makes Everybody. me think that they went all the republicans or people who are republicans were a part of some experiment you know, I watch sci-fi and they're not really human anymore. They don't need clean air. They don't need water. They don't need to wear a mask for the coronavirus. I mean, you know, we, we sit, there have been multiple versions of, of the body of the, 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 the you know, the, the, what is it? This body snatches. You know what I'm saying? Are we, are the Republicans from pods? <laughs> have, have they been switched out? Have the humans been switched out for you know, inanimate objects. I don't. We got to get back to the human side. That's for sure. We got to get back to living and figuring out how to do it together and, and be healthy as we do it and stop turning everything into a right and left issue. That's ridiculous. Well, and you know what? Uh, and, and I know uh, up in Porter County, you guys have had this issue. And I know for sure on the West side, because four years ago, your boy came in and was like, they not finna go nowhere. Con what was it? Rex Nard? Donna? They're not going anywhere. We're going to save these jobs. Mm -hmm. And I remember one of my buddies was like, well, if we can save a job, he's not going to save the job. He didn't save the job. And so the West yeah. side of Indianapolis, you know, is still struggling to bring in some businesses to replace the ones that left. Mm -hmm. How are you attracting business? If you're not educating the kids, if right. you are not working to keep the citizenry healthy mm -hmm. and you're not trying to improve the quality of life, how do you plan on attracting small businesses, medium businesses and large businesses to come in? Because that's what you say you, say you are, right? You Republicans, mm -hmm. you're about business. How are you, how you going to bring business in when people are like, yeah, but you could die living there. Yeah. Yeah, and the and the thing is that building sits empty right now, the Rexnard building, I think. But um, my concern, and, and that along with infrastructure too, we got to invest in making the West Side look as beautiful as I know it can look. But um, yeah, that's a big concern. We've got to make this area attractive. We got to clean it up. And we've got to do what it takes to attract people here and attract businesses here. If you don't have anything that's attractive or that is drawing people to you, we're going to lose a lot more than we gain. Exactly. Deb, and I know the struggles are real up there, too. Yeah. Our, our problem is we do have a lot of... Um, a lot of industry. We're very industrial up here. Mm -hmm. So we've got that going for us. Um, we've got a beautiful lakeshore. And instead of building condos and park areas, we uh, put steel mills along it. And, yes. Uh, I so <laughs> don't you just love that? It's so appealing. And I, you know, it's like, ah, uh, the aesthetics. <laughs> we do still have the beaches. Uh, they're kind of closed right now. But, um, but anyway, we, you know, so we are this industrial quarter. So we do have the industry up here and we're still able to attract jobs. We also have the proximity to Chicago, which helps our, which mm -hmm. helps as well. Because mm -hmm. it's but, expensive to live there. Yeah. And, and, but, you know, we also have this, what I call the glossy view. Um, you know, it's the, the glossy magazine, you know, the glossy flyer that we give out to the tourists, low taxes, beautiful homes. You're, you can buy you can buy a house here for what you can pay for a little tiny condo in Chicago. 
and they're buying them like crazy. I mean, you can buy what you get for a downtown condo here in Valparaiso. I, I'm just, I just can't believe people are paying that kind of money for a condo in Valparaiso. <laughs> okay. I get it. How they spend their money is how they spend their money, you know? Every, different strokes for different folks. Okay. I get it. So, um, and great. I'm mean, because it's really helping some people, you know, build this economy. That's wonderful. Mm-hmm. But, um, you know, on the other hand, we're, we are ignoring the fact that we do have an air pollution problem up here and we do have an air quality of life issue here. And, you know, and yet we still have the, the bill that's going to slow down the process to, you know, stop burning coal for power. You know, that's my, what my opponent did. So, uh, you know, cause that makes all kinds of sense. And, uh, <laughs> So, you know, you just you get the glossy view and and people who aren't from here, you know, don't buy it. Now, up here, we've got great schools. I mean, you know, Porter <clears throat> County has some really good schools and, uh, you know, that's wonderful. And so, you know, we get the people from Chicago who want to move out of the city. They want a you know, nice suburban place to live. They're buying it. They're loving it here. They still work in Chicago. Some of them can telecommute from here and only have to go and in, go into the city a couple times a week. Maybe um, it's a great way of life, and uh, that's what we're capitalizing on. Well, good. But that's we are good some good industry here too. Well, that's good, and you guys are lucky. Then I mean, other than the fact you can't breathe, I mean, you know, who needs yeah. that? I told you they come from pods. <laughs> but the, you guys both mentioned infrastructure, and 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 you know, even as we were talking about going back to school and. We, we don't know if the schools are going to shut down and people trying to, you know, work from home. We are still not treating the Internet like it's a utility like we should. Absolutely. It, you know, it, it needs to be that it needs to be the next, you know, in in 1920, they looked at they looked at the nation and said, huh, the people who live in town have a better quality of life than the people in the rural areas. Let's get electricity to those people in the rural areas because that's what is doing it. We've got the same thing with internet, but it isn't always rural in in city. There are there are areas of cities where there's no good internet too. Mm-hmm. So we need to we just really need to make internet broadband, five gig internet, blanket it wall to wall across the state. Just mm-hmm. do it and make that it would benefit everyone especially with our new virtual learning curve yeah yeah uh, it's so so needed for a lot of our our families so yeah absolutely yeah. we got i mean it's it's past time we this again this virus is is pulled the rug out so we can see all the cracks in the foundation and we see the silly little orange man behind the curtain we are no longer fooled we see how bad these things are and we need leaders in our state house that understand what it is to struggle, but to work, be able to have somebody help you out and get better, or you know, find some bootstraps in, 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 in on the side of the road and see if they fit your boots and do the best you can, raise your kids, keep them fed, get them all out of college. We need people that understand what it is to be real, not somebody whose daddy, granddaddy had a business. And they've never really had to work other than, you know, making their bed up. I don't, I don't know. I don't, I, and that's, and we need to change that. I mean, I, Todd Houston is one of those folks that just drives me nuts. He lives in, in Hamilton County, he represents Hamilton County. And for him, he is so disconnected from the rest of, of Indiana and what Indiana needs. He thinks everybody can be like Hamilton County. Hamilton mm-hmm. County is just the highest income per capita in the entire state. Sorry. It's not, you guys got lucky. Because y'all don't want to live in Indianapolis, you take a little funky tax dollars somewhere else while you CEOs and whatever the hell. I'm, I'm sorry, I get angry about that one. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. <laughs> Deb, tell yeah. the people where they can find you so they can donate to your campaign. Well, for me, if you go to our Facebook page, Renee Pack for State Representative, and click on Act Blue, I'm more than happy to accept your donations. I appreciate it so much. So are you, are you doing any virtual um, fundraisers? Are you doing any virtual phone banking? What, what, what are we doing? We did. Our last fundraiser was in July. We won't have one this month, but we wanted to September and October dates are pending um, on that probably Thursday um, in September and a Thursday in October. We phone bank 
regularly. And that's, I mean, with the coronavirus and all of that, that's been a huge part of uh, reaching out to voters because we can't meet them face to face. So you can contact me about phone banking also. Excellent. And then we get to work. Excellent. Ms. Deb, tell the people how they can find you. Okay. So on, yeah, on Facebook and on our website, it's um, debforindiana.com and Facebook is the same address. We are um, doing, um, we have virtual phone banks set up. So anybody from anywhere can do that. We have a volunteer and donate buttons on our website, which you can easily access from our Facebook page. We have actually two live events coming up because we have found some outside venues that are, you know, they're big and they're going to allow us for nice social distancing. One of them is this coming Wednesday. It's at a vineyard and we're going to celebrate the 100th anniversary of women's suffrage. And I just think it's great that 100 years after women finally get the vote. And let me remind everybody that when that happened, women of color still were not allowed to vote. Mm -hmm. That's right. And so 100 years after that, we are finally going to be able to vote for a woman of color as our vice president and how cool that is. Hey. And so, you know, we're just we're just going to hear those glass ceilings just keep pounding away. And in this year, we've got more female candidates in the state of Indiana than we've ever had before. So this is just a great time to, um, you know, to be a female and to be a Democrat and to get out and vote. But we are also going to be having some virtual fundraising events later on in uh, mid-September. So, um, yeah, so like I said, um, debforindiana.com and on Facebook, Deb for Indiana. That's what's up. And, you know, just to piggyback off of what you just said, even though women of color, black women, black women knew we couldn't get the vote, we were still there fighting anyway. We was Always. right there. <laughs> We was right there. We was like, look, if if they don't get it, we show the heck ain't getting it. So we better come on and try to help each other get this. Now that was some some some, some shadiness going on because you know humans are gonna human. That's right. Yep. But we was right there. We were not deterred, honey. Miss Ida B. Well said, I'm not going to the back. I'm going right up here in the front. Say I can't. Say I can't. I mean, I yeah. love it. I, I <laughs> and speaking bold, of bold women. Oh, honey. And speaking of women, y'all, one of the things that I'm really excited about, I, 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 Angela Ray is one of those fo- folks who uh, y- y- you see on, on the, the YouTubes and the other channels, the talk shows and things like that. And she had a, uh, a roundtable discussion with some amazing thinkers and, and, and policy processors from around the country. And I saw that and I was like, oh, what if we had something like that in India? Why don't I do something like that in Indiana, <laughs> right? So, y'all, on the 25th, on the 25th of August, after, I think that's the date. I might have it right. The t- Tuesday after the convention week. So, convention is next week. Enjoy that. You know, do our virtual camaraderie, rah, rah, cheer, cheer. But the week after that, we are going to have a roundtable discussion with b- ladies, black women in our party. Because, see, I know sometimes, like, y'all be thinking, like, people like Kamala Harris, as brilliant as she is and as unique a woman as she is, like, she's one of only a handful. No, 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 no. There's a whole bunch of us out here. And I think the reason why so many people are surprised, oh, my God, a woman of color, where would you find one that's actually qualified? Oh, my Lord, where do they exist? They every damn where. And we and we decided, I, I literally was like sending people messages like, let's have this conversation. And since everything is virtual, we can do everything virtually. And we are going to have young leaders, m- mature leaders, some of our matriarchs. We got people, we have women from all nine congressional districts who will talk about what it is to be a black woman in Indiana Democratic Party watching the VP, Senator Kamala Harris get nominated, but we're also going to talk about the state of our party and, and air, the things that we need to focus in on in our general area. So we, I don't have any candidates on this show. There are no candidates. This is not a candidate form. This is a way for 
people within the party, be they elected or be they party officials, where we can talk about what role we play in our party so people can stop being surprised, shocked, and oh my God, there's a black person, a black woman. We are here, we are plentiful, and we work alongside our brothers and sisters. We're not trying to always toot our horn and say, look at me, I'm the only one that does that. No one else does that. Everybody else is just out here doing the work right? Everybody else is doing the work, but you need to see who these women are because we have a strong and amazing bench. There's an election. We have election three out of four years. And so when you get an opportunity to see who these people are and the things that they're working on and the areas that they're working on, they won't become strange to you. It will not be unusual to you to see all these strong thinking, processing, Understanding what life is, black women. I got a doctor on the show. I got people that ran for mayor, ran for Congress, those that are elected. And of course, we have our matriarch, our matriarch. And I don't care what y'all say. Miss Cordelia Lewis Burks, who is the vice chair of our state party, will be opening this thing up. So y'all, if y'all, I mean, I know that... Don't get too wore out from the convention that you can't come check out all these beautiful black women, all these melanated women. And listen, there's another event coming up in October. I'm working with the ninth district, uh, the, the, uh, Jennifer Crossley and, and Natalia down, uh, the, 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 the ninth district Latino caucus, um, in October. And I believe it's October 3rd. We're doing a power of the black and brown vote. Cause see, they be trying to divide us up. We're not doing that. They be trying to divide us up. We in this thing together and we gonna stand in, in, in unity together. So mark your calendars. Democrats in Indiana are not going away. We are not invisible. We are here trying to serve you, trying to show you who the people are who are looking out for you. These two ladies understand what it is that you're going through. So if you like what they said to you tonight, click on their link. It's in, you know me, I put it, I always put it in the information. That way you ain't gotta go look for it. Click on the link. Donate to their campaigns because they got to drop lit. They got to make sure they have phones. They got to do everything they can um, to make sure that we get these ladies in our state house so we can flip the supermajority. We need to flip the supermajority because what? It's a census year and there's redistricting. So we want to make sure that supermajority is not drawing lines so that the largest county only has two senators. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. We got 800,000 people in Marion County mm -hmm. with these two senators. Yeah. And there's 50. So I'm I'm sorry. Yeah. But anyway, <laughs> I'm just saying, y'all, Indiana Zone Dana Black, Democrats are always out here doing what we do to look out for people. We put people over profits first. Be safe as you send your kids back to school. We are doing this thing every week. Uh, I got more guests coming. You know me. I'm talking to any and everybody that is willing to put their name on the ballot, put themselves out front to represent you. All right. I'll holler next time. Ladies, thank you for joining me. Thank you. Thank you. Peace.